All right. Hey. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to do the intro. Mark's going, aren't you supposed to say something? Hey, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> hey, welcome, everybody, to episode 22 of Ripple Live. We are together in the uh, cyberspace community, and we're uh, glad to have you all here. We're super excited about the show, and we have a lot of great things to, to talk about, and uh, Mark's going to tell you about how the show works. We're going to change the format slightly from the previous ones and but we think you're really going to like it yeah good good to see you steve and uh good to have everybody join us in this sort of crazy time right now it's uh great that we have this virtual community and we're glad we get to spend some time with you and you know a lot of you guys know we we sent out a request for questions early to get a sense of what you guys wanted to talk about and you <laughs> You gave us a lot. Um, in fact, I'm going to just share my screen real quickly right here and um, start sharing. And if we go to the questions here, uh, you can see here on my screen, we we took all those questions and built a spreadsheet out of them in order to kind of uh, triage them and figure out how to attack them because we got like almost 80, 80 different questions in here. So when Steve mentions that the um, format's gonna change a little bit, what we're gonna do here is first try to address those in an efficient manner. So we've been spending the past day or so going through those and uh, collecting them together so that we can answer them uh, really as quickly as possible and as thoroughly as possible. But we'll still take your questions that you post today. And uh, don't worry about the time. Like we've decided we're gonna go as long as you want us to pretty much today. So we're not gonna do a hard stop in exactly one hour if you still continue to have questions. So you can post them now. You just post them in the chat window there. Um, there's a little dollar sign. If you wanna make sure we see it, you can click on that dollar sign and make a nominal contribution. And what that does is it pins your post so it comes up higher. It's not required. We'll, get to as many questions as we possibly can, but it does make it stick out. And a contribution, of course, helps the show. But we get everybody's in, you know, it's a different time, and if it's something you can't do, no problem. Don't worry about that at all. I just want to point out it's there. If you can do it, great. Um, so I think that's it. We're going to start out. Steve's going to talk about a couple of things we have going on in terms of products. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll first dive into, after he does that, we're just going to take, he and I will take turns trying to cover a bunch of those questions that you guys have already asked. And then from there, we'll go into live answering questions that you're posting. Right, so um, what I wanna, wanna show you first, I'm gonna uh, jump over to uh, my screen here, Travi. Um, so we're running two specials right now. Um, one is on media management. And, and it's really surprising to me how many questions we get on media management, you know, what to do with the media. So we took one of our most popular tutorials in media management and made it $10. And just so uh, we just wanna be able to help people out. And this, this tutorial is normally $59, it's on sale for 10. We haven't put an end date on it. Um, I haven't really thought about that yet, but right now it's $10, you know, who knows, it'll go another week, two weeks, I haven't decided yet, or we haven't decided, but Certainly a really great deal um, on that. And Mark is actually gonna cover some media management uh, questions that were answered. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. We also have another one of his tutorials, it's $10. I, I wanna talk about this warp speed motion for a moment because motion is killer. That's how we build all of our plugins. Uh, like we built our, our punch in effect, all of that using motion. We didn't do any coding. and. This is a fantastic companion app to Final Cut Pro 10. And for people who want to get into it, we created this warp speed motion for Final Cut editors. For, so if you don't want to learn all the ins and outs of the program, but just want to learn enough to, to get really cool stuff done, like building titles and effects and transitions, replace screens, uh, this is a fantastic tutorial. And this one as well is only 10 bucks and it's regularly 59. So anyway, just wanted to, wanted to point that out. And uh, we're going to now jump into the just the heart of our show, which is getting to your questions and trying to get as many of them done as we can. So I'll take it away, Mr. Mark. Great, thank you, Steve. So I'm sharing my screen now, um, and assuming it's shared, this is just where I've collected some of these questions related to media management, and I wanted to, to mention them, and then I'm gonna jump into a little demo here. One question was, will Apple ever help us with Final Cut Pro 10 media management where we can delete everything except the used media in a project along with everything else selected by the editor. 
Um, so just in general, if you have any question about will Apple do something, will a feature come out, is something going to happen in the future, uh, we can't address those. We, we don't know. Um, so um, I can't tell you. I understand it's something that people want to be able to trim the product project back, but I'm bringing it up here because I'm going to show you what you can do today because there's a fair amount you actually can do. Another question was, I have a project spanning four years and four separate external hard drives. Any tips, suggestions, or secrets for consolidating libraries onto one storage device? So I'm going to cover that. Uh, what parts of a Final Cut Pro 10 project really need to be saved when done with the production? We're going to talk about that. Archiving strategies, separating source videos from Final Cut Pro libraries after a job is done. Can I keep smaller libraries with low res media handy while archiving large source files offline? We'll cover that, archiving big projects smallest space possible. So we get you know, a lot of questions about basically archiving projects, consolidating projects, simplifying projects to be able to put them away. So here's my simple example uh, to walk through this. So I have a library up here. I have multiple libraries open because there's other things to talk about later in the show, but I have one called My Disorganized Library. Okay, so let's say this is a, a, a library of, of a project I've been working on for a long time, and I have one project in it, just to make things simple and easy to understand, and I have some clips in the browser. I've turned on show media ranges, that's the orange part here, so we can tell portions of these clips are used in the currently open project, and some of them aren't. I have video clips, I have an audio clip, I have some stills, and that's gonna be all very important in just a minute. Now, the first thing you should really do, if you select the library itself in the inspector, it brings up the library properties. And not everybody realizes how much super useful information is available in here. So I just wanna briefly go through that before we do anything to this library. So at the very top, it tells you um, where the library itself is located. And in my case, it's located on my boot drive, which has the exciting name Macintosh HD. And you can see it's 800 megabytes, okay? The next thing says, where do you wanna store the media? And you can store it in the library or in some external location. Just because this says in the library doesn't mean my media is actually in the library, okay? So this is a really critical point. Even though you set your storage location to be in the library, you still have the option of leaving clips where they are. So if I bring up preferences, command comma, and we look at our import tab of preferences, my preferences are set to leave files in place. Uh, I could have set them to copy to the library storage location, which means copy to the location that you had set up over here in your library properties. But if you had set leave files in place, and then you drag and drop files into your event, they will be left where they are. Um, or if you choose the import window, command I, the default here will be to leave the files in place. Okay, so just something to be aware of that even though in the library inspector, you set up the target to be in the library or to be a specific folder on a specific drive, um, they won't necessarily go there if you're dragging and dropping, depending on how your preferences are set up. And you can override that. You can override the default drag and drop behavior. Um, next is motion content. We'll talk about it in a minute. I'll skip that. We see the cache is stored in the library. It's about um, a gig of a big gig there. And now check this out at the bottom. Storage used for media and motion content. So this tells me where all the media is. And I have media for this project spread across four different drives. I've got some on my local drive. It could be in the library, because when the library is on, on the local drive, but you can't tell from here. It's just there's media on the local drive, there's media on my RAID, and there's media on these two other connected drives, okay? So that's giving me good information. The very first thing I'm gonna do is consolidate that media. I'm gonna say I'm done with this project and I don't want it spread out over all these drives. Or maybe I'm not done with it, but I just wanna consolidate it to get in one drive so I don't have to leave all these drives connected, okay? There's many scenarios here. But what I'm gonna do is first under modify settings, make sure I have a location chosen for my media. So I don't want it in the library. I'm actually gonna target my RAID and I have a folder called Completed Projects Media. And in there, I'm gonna create a new folder and I'll call it um, uh, Today's Project. Sorry, it's not a great name, but you'll get the picture here. So this is where I'm gonna put that media, okay? 
So the media is going to be stored in this folder called Today Project. Now, doing that didn't do anything. All it did is tell it going forward, if I import media and I didn't tell it to leave in place, it's going to go into that folder. But it didn't change any of this existing media. It's still sitting across these drives. So the first part is to tell it where to go. And the second part is to consolidate. So now I'm going to click the consolidate button and that will go ahead and take all my media across all those drives and copy that media to that target location. I'm not going to include optimized or proxy media because I don't need it. So I'll just click that. One important thing to understand here is that when Final Cut is um, copying media from external locations, Final Cut will never delete media that's external to the library. There's, there's no command in Final Cut that you can do that will delete media that's external to the library. So just something to keep in mind. Why that's important, if we now look at our storage locations here, we can see all those other drive disappeared and the entire media, a little under a gigabyte, um, tiny example here, but it's all on the RAID. So it's not the media that it's, it's referencing is not on those drives anymore. It's all been consolidated to a single location in a single folder. That media still exists on those other drives. So if you have a ton of media and you've consolidated it down to one drive and then you want to go delete it from those other drives, you need to know where it is. There's, there's not a super easy way for Final Cut to tell you where it is. You can always right click a clip before you consolidate and say reveal in Finder and that'll, that's fine if all the media on a certain drive is in the same location. But just a caveat that if you want to go delete all that media on all those separate drives, which you can do, um, you know, it can be a little bit of work to find it all. But know that you've got a copy of all that media now in a single location. Okay. So that's kind of the first part, is I've now consolidated this library to a single folder on a single drive, but it's still the same size. The next thing I want to do is get rid of any generated media because I want to cut down the size of this thing. So you can do this on a project level, an event level, or the entire library. Since my library is selected, if I go to the file menu and I choose um, delete generated library files, and in here I can delete any render files, any optimized or proxy media, and it's safe, I'm gonna do all render files. This is a safe operation. There, it's not gonna get rid of your original media. Generated library files mean, means media that's generated from your original files and you can always regenerate it. So once you're archiving, if you don't need those render files, that you, know, you can just save a lot of space here. In fact, if you looked down in our inspector here under the cache, we have about a gigabyte of cache. Those are render files. They can also be analysis files and other things as well, but it's about 800 megabytes. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete all that. And it may take a minute, but we should see that cache update. Yeah, so it just went down to four megabytes, okay? So I just drastically cut down the amount of uh, space my project is taking up by getting rid of all the generated media. And again, you can do that on an event basis or a project basis. You don't have to do it library-wide. Okay, now, Let's say I'm gonna do two, two scenarios here. One is like, well, that's great, but I don't want all this media in the browser. I just want the media that I used in this project, which isn't all the media in my whole thing. All I want is my, my cut, my final cut. Okay, so here's the way I recommend you do that. I recommend you make a new library, and I'll just call this one um, project only. Then I'll go back to my disorganized library, which is now organized. I'm going to take that project and notice this library here includes media that's not included in the project. This clip's not in the project. That clip's not in the project. Um, I'm going to drag this into the new one. I don't need to include optimized or proxy media. And now in this new one, if I open up this project in this new library, it's only included clips that are included in the project. It includes the entire clips. It does, this goes to the, frat, the first question. It does not trim the media. There, um, there are some products out there that will do that. Works 4X, W-O-R-X, 4, number 4X, will trim media for you. So there are products that will do that. But what this operation does is take just the clips that were in your project, um, and the entire clips and puts them all in one library. So that's project only. 
So if that's all you wanted, you could do that. And then if you wanted to take a step further, you could consolidate those clips inside the library. So the library itself is a self-contained unit. Okay, so that's one option. The final thing I wanna talk about is, is proxy. Um, and Steve just did a great uh, Mac Break Studio about a, an alternate way to create proxy media, which is different than what I'm gonna talk about here, because I wanna answer the question is like, how do I make this small as possible? Well. We could make proxies of this and just have it point to the proxies. Remember, all the media in this library, my disorganized library, is sitting inside. If I go to modify settings, it's sitting in this today project. That's the folder it's in, okay? So if I make proxy media, I can make proxy media inside the library so it's completely separate. So what I'm gonna do is modify settings. I'm gonna choose to put my media in the library now. Then with the event selected, I'll go to file and choose, um, I'm gonna to choose to transcode media and I'm gonna create proxy media. So what this is gonna do, and you have to do this after you've done this other operation to get all the, the existing media out, this is gonna take all your proxy media and stick it inside the library completely separate from your original media. Uh, you can see here that it's going through. I'll let, let it go through there. It just, it's not going to take very long. I did this early. It won't take very long to do this. But once it's done, we'll have proxy media inside the library and our original media in a single folder on a separate drive. So really now what I could do is take this project with my library that's on my local hard drive with all the proxy media and take it with me. Okay? So if I now switch to that's done, and in fact, if we go back to the library inspector, and check it out, we can see um, on my Macintosh hard drive is proxy media, about 800 megs of proxy media, not a whole lot smaller, which is why Steve recommended that HEVC thing that you should check out. But depending on, this wasn't big footage to begin with, but there's my proxy media. So now if I take this project and switch to um, using proxy, so up here I'll choose proxy. Um, da, 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 da. Missing proxy. Make sure I made proxy on the right. Yeah, I've got proxy media. Make sure I've, oh, you know why I had to open, I had opened the project from this other project only library. There it is. So now this is all proxy media, okay? Um, if we look under the view pop-up menu, we're set to proxy and reviewing proxies uh, on a library. The last thing is you need to know about if you do this, any clips that are video that are audio only or stills, Final Cut doesn't make proxies of audio or stills. So you need to get those into the library. So the very last thing you could do here is create a new event. This is, just, I think, the fastest way to do this. And I'm gonna call it um, audio and stills. Okay. And I wanna get those original source files inside the library. So you can use your smart collections to go and say, hey, there's my stills, okay. I'll command A to select them all and I'll drag them into this event. And then here's, here's uh, audio only, I'll select all those, just one clip, and I'll throw that also into this event. So this event now contains um, just audio and stills. And I wanna consolidate those in the library. So because you can consolidate at an event level, I'll go into the file menu, menu and choose to consolidate event media. And remember we had target inside the library. So now we have inside the library, proxy media for all video and the original media for any audio only or any stills, all packaged in the library that we can take with us and all the original source media is sitting in a single drive. Um, I hope that wasn't too long, Steve, but that was uh, that I wanted to consolidate and try to answer all those questions together. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm uh, assuming my, my mic's live again, which is good. Uh, so, uh, sorry about that. We just sometimes, you know, it's been a few weeks since we've done this. So I appreciate the, the feedback that uh, we can make some improvements. I had one comment, Mark. Someone said there was this, uh, this, there's an annoying screen reflection behind you in, the, uh, in that... <clears throat> LCD monitor that's behind you. So anyway, just uh, someone pointed that out. So I just thought I'd bring it up. There's a, like a white spot there. Anyway, um, but of course it would require you changing your light setup. So anyway, 
Um, questions. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions. I've been doing my best to answer a lot of them directly in the chat while my, uh, Mark is presenting. And uh, I, I want to get to kind of my group of questions, uh, which was related to Final Cut uh, keyboard shortcuts. Um, I'm going to quickly um, jump out, uh, jump out here to my, my spreadsheet here. And I have a lot of questions on keyboard commands, shortcuts, uh, my favorite keyboard shortcuts, workflows, transitions. There's a bunch of stuff here. So what I, what I thought I'd do is just kind of consolidate some of these questions into kind of like the best of my best of keyboard shortcuts, things that I use all the time for working very quickly. And what I want to start out with is a question that was asked about uh, from a Simon. And he asked, well, how can I move around the Final Cut Pro 10 interface without touching a mouse? So that's a really good question. So what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and close this library for a, mo for a moment. And then we'll work with this library. So um, if, you, if you don't want to physically click into the various places like the source, the browser, the viewer, or the timeline, here's the keyboard shortcut. If I press the tab key, um, you won't be able to see this probably very well on your screen, but but when a when an area is in focus, you'll see a light blue line at the very top of that area. So right now, the, the library and the browser is the focus. So if I press tab, this becomes a focus. I press tab again, and now you'll see the blue bar over the timeline. So tab, tab, tab will move you from one area of focus to the other. So what's great is if I get back to the library browser, I get to the library, then once the library is selected, and you can see it's selected up there on the top, I can use my arrow keys. So like, for example, I could press the right arrow, and look at that, it spills open the library, I didn't even use my mouse, and I use my down arrow to jump into the events. So I jump into event, and I'm gonna use my right arrow, and it spills open, if, oh, I gotta find one with keyword collection. So using right and left arrow, I can spill open, and I can see what's in that event. Now here's something really cool. You guys are gonna like this. I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna close this library by pressing the left arrow key. Um, someone showed me this once and it's fantastic. What if you wanted to open up all your events at the same time and see every keyword collection? So you don't have to go through and click every one of those little triangles to spill everything open. If you hold down the option key and type and tap the right arrow, watch what happens. Bada bing. Look at that, every event opens with the keywords and whatever you have in those events exposed. So really useful keyboard shortcut. Uh, option, right arrow will, uh, and left arrow will of course close it, but it's a, a quick way to see all the contents of your event really quickly. So that's the uh, answer to, my, to the first question about m moving around the interface with just the keyboard without having to click anywhere. Okay, so, the other thing I wanted to go over was a series of keyboard shortcuts. What, what are my favorite keyboard shortcuts? So what I'm gonna do is um, jump into this little timeline right here. And let's talk about the first one. Um, I've got this very simple timeline open right now. And off, oftentimes you wanna select a clip to do something to it. And, and it's really kind of a pain to be clicking on things all the time. You don't really need to click. So the first keyboard shortcut I wanna show you is the C key. C key, of course, will select the clip. So if I move the play into the next clip, C, C. And so what's nice is I can press C and then press Command X, move the play somewhere else, then press Option V to paste on top, down, press C, Command X, move up, uh, and then Option V. And so now I've got this stack and I didn't, again, didn't do anything uh, with the mouse. Now what's also nice is another one of my favorite uh, keyboard shortcuts is the ability to select uh, stacked clips. Well, right now, um, the clip that's being selected has the active clip indicator, that's the topmost clip. But what if I wanted to select the clip on the bottom or the clip in the middle? That's the next thing, that a uh, next keyboard shortcut I really like, is if you hold down the command key and tap the down arrow, you can then move your selection up and down the list, like this. So for example, if I wanted to move up there and disable that clip, I would then press the V key to disable that clip. You know, I can press the V and then move down and uh, command down arrow. And you can see that uh, it's really a really great way to not have to touch the mouse. 
And in fact, I can even loop this. So if I press the forward slash key, notice I'm pressing the forward sign. That, that, that plays into out. And what's fantastic about that, notice it's just playing into out and I want to see the clip directly below it. Well, since that's selected, I just press the V key. And now I can see the clip directly below it. Press V again. I want to go up a level. Command up. Press V. And now I'm looking at the top level. All right. Now, one of my favorite shortcuts, I actually learned this. I can't believe I didn't know this. Somebody in the Ripple Live a few episodes back showed me this. I didn't even think about this. Like, what if I wanted to trim everything to this playhead? Well, of course, you know, you can get the blade tool and you could, or you could press Shift B and uh, you could blade it. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Um, you could, a command should be, you could blade everything. Command Shift B will blade everything and then you delete it, right? Uh, that's one way to, to do it. The other way is, um, and I like this a lot, just move your playhead where you want to trim to. So I want to trim to right there, right? Press Command A. Now I want to trim everything to the playhead because they're selected. Now I'm just going to press Option, right bracket. Just like that. Everything's trimmed to the playhead. Uh, so Option, right black, black bracket works if you have all of the clips selected as I, as I did here. So a lot of fun. All right, so let's move to a trimming because this is another really essential keyboard shortcut that, I mean, every Final Cut Pro, most of you probably already know the command I'm going to show you, but it's, but there's some things about it that you may not know. For example, I've got this, if I play this timeline, I've got some problems with it. I'll just play a little bit of it. And you could hear there's got a few problems with like double re the, the actor repeating their lines. There's kind of some overlap here. Do I get a shark cage? What? Okay, how big of a shark are we talking about here? Shark are we talking about here? Okay, so obviously I need to trim some of this. So one way, of course, is I just move the playhead okay. to where I want. And you can actually don't even need the playhead. You could use this, uh, the skimmer as long as the skimming is turned on, S. <laughs> because the skimmer is priority in Final Cut. It, well, the skimmer is in the timeline and ignores the playhead. So if I want to trim the head of this Nicole shot, I just skim, right? And I'm going to use then my bracket keys, my left and right bracket. So option, left bracket, will trim that Nicole shot to the skimmer. And if I move over here to the out point, I skim there and I want to trim the out point, it's option, right bracket. So that's, most of you know that, but here's what a lot of, I discovered a lot of people don't know is that you can do this without actually the skimmer. You can just use, just use keyboard shortcuts. And here's the key. So if I move my playhead to an edit point, like right there, once your playhead is on an edit point, then you could use your left and right bracket keys to select an edit point. So I could select the outgoing, I could select the incoming, and then if I use the backslash key, I could select the in and out. But the key is the edit has, the playhead has to be on an edit point before you can then make the adjustment, before you then make the adjustment. And what's nice about this is then when it's selected, then you could use your comma and period keys to make the trim. And you can even do this while your clip is playing back, which is fantastic. If you, uh, if I go up to the uh, playback menu and I do, I do a play around, which is shift question mark, it'll play okay, over. And then now as it's playing, I can make okay, edits. Okay, how big of a shark would you a shark cage? I'm working on the other okay, side of the edit. Okay, how big of a shark would you doing it? So super, super fast way of editing. Um, you just loop it and then use your your bracket, your your bracket keys, excuse me, the common period keys to then trim the edit point. So that's another one of my super favorite uh, keyboard shortcuts. Let's see if there's a couple of other ones. Um, oh, and this is the last one. Another one that's uh, my favorite is I don't like to go over to the uh, the the inspect the inspector excuse me the um, this view thing over here and I don't like I don't like necessarily like clicking on these this is a lot of time one of my favorites is if you hold uh, if you hold down uh, control and option and then use your up and down arrow key you could cycle through the various track display options so option control up and down arrow, or you can use control option one, two, three, four on the keyboard. One, two, three, four. So I find that to be really useful. All right, so those are my awesome keyboard shortcuts, and I'm sure um, a lot of you already use those. Maybe you learned it, picked up a few, but 
those are the ones that I that I use. <laughs> all right. So, so, what's next, Mark? We got some questions. That was great. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer just one right here, and then I'll go into my motion tip here. This is a uh, Scott uh, Geely's and Scott is sorry I'm saying your name incorrectly. He's using Ripple uh, RT punch ins and wants to, after he punches in, he wants to pan to different areas of the screen. And he's saying that the pan is good, but it's only for one additional move. So Scott, you can use multiple pans. Like after you've done one, you can leave it stretched all the way across and just add a new pan um, uh, underneath that or above it. I can't remember right now, but just add another one and then you can pan again. So you can pan to one part of the interface, you can pan to another, you don't have to, you don't have to zoom back out again. You just keep adding pans and you keep panning around wherever you want and then just trim them all so they end at the same time as the original punch in so you can zoom back out and that should work for you. Um, so I thought I had a bunch of questions about, I'm gonna start screen sharing here, uh, motion and I thought I'd answer um, a couple of them and try to bundle those a little bit together too. So what you're looking at here, so we're in motion and I had a question about basically doing this animation. So you have a bar and it slides over and reveals some text, okay? And that's pretty easy to do in motion. Just, you know, I've got a mask here. that You can see that that's lined up with a bar and it's revealing it. So that's pretty easy to do. But the question becomes, how do you do it so that you can publish it to Final Cut so you can do it for any length of text in any location? Um, that's where things get a little tricky. So this thing works great if I take the text and move it like you would in Final Cut, or I say of any length uh, possible, let's just add a word to it, and then move it somewhere else, it should still work. And you'll see here in this case, uh, it does still work. And the trick about it is for the line, we actually, I'm using two different align behaviors to do this. Uh, the, the guy who posted the question, I'm sorry, I don't have your name in front of me here, was trying to use the offset parameter. If you look here in the behaviors inspector, we have the, um, the bar is originally aligned to the right side of the text. And he was using the offset to move it. And that's not gonna get you where you wanna go. You wanna leave the offset alone so you could publish it and that people could adjust it in Final Cut. Instead, you leave this one set as no transition. So it will be locked hard to the right side of the text. And then you add this another one. I notice I've called this one align to left. I've just renamed these. And the align to left, I set the transition to custom so I could set keyframes so that that um, alignment takes place over a fixed period of time. And now that zooms, that opens it up. So that's kind of the trick. And then the last piece was just taking this rectangle mask and using the line to, to force the restang, rectangle mask, excuse me, to be aligned exactly to the left side of that bar um, and to make it big enough so no matter what you type, it'll still work. So um, sometimes you have to do things. What I find when you're making motion projects so that they work in Final Cut and they can be adjusted, the length of the text, the size of the background, things like that is still work. You kind of have to think through some different approaches. Um, I'm also bringing this up because I am coming out with a new tutorial focused on using behaviors in motion, all the different kind of behaviors in motion, simulation behaviors, um, camera behaviors, match move behaviors, all of them. And this is a great example of behaviors. Um, I did use keyframes, but the cool thing is you can combine keyframes and behaviors to a really powerful effect. Um, the one other one I'm gonna mention here is somebody asked how I do an animated picture in picture uh, in Final Cut. And I'm not gonna build it from scratch, I'll just show you I've done it here. Like let's say you're in Final Cut and you've got a talking head and you want them to shrink down and show the background. So in motion, I created a new effect type and you can see the animation here. Um, I'm just having this thing shrink down. It's real simple. It scales down. It's got a border, a simple border effect on it. And I've keyframed the scale and position so it shrinks down. And I keyframed the border opacity so it, it turns on as it shrinks down. I've also published the border color and the border width and the position and scale of the group so you can still change this in Final Cut. And then I added a built-in marker here so that when you apply this to the clips of different duration, this initial animation won't change in timing. So if I put this thing into Final Cut, so I'll go to Final Cut and here I've got a talking head and I've got a background. And if I want that to work with her, I'll go to the effects library because I say this as an effect under my effects is where I saved it. And if I throw that onto her, 
And let's just, I'm gonna just turn the volume down here for the audio. And if I play that, okay, she'll now shrink down and reveal the background of what she's talking about. And if we look in the inspector here for Final Cut, you see I've got the published, I could change that border color to something else and change the width of it just because I published these parameters. And even though it has a fixed, you know, I could change the position in X and Y, I can move that wherever I want to, and then that will be the correct the, the position there. So you've got some flexibility or I could scale it down, what have you. Um, so that's just an example of trying to answer the question about like creating an animated picture in picture effect that you can put into Final Cut. And this is what is great, mo so great about motion. I can make this in five minutes and have a nice effect that you could use over and over again. Uh, so those are a couple of little motion tips there, Steve. A couple of questions uh, regarding workflow in Final Cut Pro 10. And then uh, uh, we've had some questions about what we use for our, our streaming setup. Uh, quite a few people have asked us what we what we do. We are going to be getting to that shortly. I'm just kind of going through all of these uh, questions first. Um, so the first one is, is regards to um, transitions. For example, um, if I, well, the question had to do with how come I get that this, how come I get this dialog box? You know, when I add a transition by pressing Command T, I get this create transition. Why am I even seeing that? Well, the reason you're seeing that is because there's not enough media handles on either side of this cup point. You can see that because you've got the red, the red um, brackets. So you could force the transition. That's really what that is. It's a for, it's a force transition uh, kind of a deal. So if I Command T and I say force it. Um, right now, if I click Create Transition, what I'll do is it's warning me that I'm going to basically lose a second off my timeline. So I could force it and make it, but down here, I lost a second of total duration from my timeline. So just wanted to point that out. You can do it. Just be aware of that. Okay, so maybe that's not a problem. But I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about the precision editor. Someone asked me, what's a precision editor? Do I care? And I honestly... I. I'll hardly ever think of the precision editor, but it's useful in a situation like this because uh, I could see with a precision editor if there's media handles. And by the way, you just get to it by just double clicking on a cut it point. And of course, the graphics open up and now I can see the outgoing clip and the incoming. What's nice about this is that you can actually see the available media handles for the clip. That's This is how I use it. I don't actually use it for trimming because it's. I feel it's just too cumbersome. The trimming method I just showed you with the keyboard shortcuts are so much faster. But if you had to use this, you could skim to where you wanted, and then you just click, and you re and you just click where you want, and you reset the edit point to wherever you wherever your mouse clicks. That's all. That's all it is. Okay. So I, f I find it pretty useless uh, for editing, but I do find it useful sometimes to check to see if I have uh, available media handles. All right, and then you guys, if you want to comment, maybe you have another reason why you use it. Maybe you have a valid reason for using it. I don't, but uh, there you have it. So the other question I had was somebody asked about working with keynote uh, presentations. And um, what's nice is, you know, how do I get my keynote presentations into Final Cut Pro 10 uh, to use? You know, I'm, I'm shooting a lecture and I have myself on camera and I, and I want to cut to the slides. Well, you could use Keynote or you could use PowerPoint. It really doesn't matter. But point is, you can then go to the file menu and you could choose export to and you could choose movie and then you could choose the resolution 1080p or custom. And then you can then actually render it out in ProRes 422 or 444. Yes, everybody needs to render out their PowerPoint presentations in Apple ProRes 444. Actually, I don't want to be, that should, that, there's a reason that's there, by the way. Um, if you have transparency, I haven't tried this, the Apple ProRes 4444 will allow you to save the transparency out with your keynote. So um, that's why there's two options there. But you could, you know, I'd probably just use 422, click next, and then you go ahead and save this out as a movie. I'm not going to do, because, you know, at that point, you just find the movie and then you just, you import it into Final Cut Pro, and then it becomes a source just like any, uh, you know, a source clip, just like any other source clip. All right, so let me see if there's another related question. Uh, there was a question about titles. Is there a way to 
is there a way of the default settings in the inspector when using titles, especially setting a default font, color, and outline? I tend to use the font and color and not the default settings. Okay, good question. So let's say I wanted a, a title here. I'm gonna hit uh, Control T, add a title, which made it too long there. And I'm gonna go ahead and change uh, some of the attributes of that title in the inspector. Open up, open up the inspector and see, I'm gonna change the, the font, change the impact, I'm gonna change the size. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and down here, I'm gonna give it an outline and make the outline a little thicker. Make the outline a little thicker here. And maybe I'll even throw on a drop shadow, okay. And so I have a drop shadow there and I'm gonna go ahead and make the uh, distance a little wider there. Okay, so there's, there's my font. And the question is, look, I don't wanna have to do this every single time I create a title and you don't really have to. If you go to the top of the title inspector, there's a drop down that allows you to save different attributes of, of the title. Starting from the top, if you choose save format attributes, what that's gonna save is everything you did to the font, uh, to the title itself, the size, the font, all that stuff, the tracking, that's the formatting. However, you could also save the appearance. That's what I did to the title, the outline and the color and the shadow. So you could save either the font and attributes or the appearance. But I find in a lot of cases, you could do both. I save the all format and appearance attributes. And then if I, if I do that, you know, I'll call this uh, uh, bold, bold with outline and I'll click save. And now if I create another title here, control, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this another way, control T, and add a three point edit of my title, select the title and then up at the top of the title inspector, look at that, there is my, there it is. So I've, it's a great way to save a bunch of time. You can do this with 2D titles and 3D titles. All right, so good. That's awesome. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so um, you've been monitoring the chat feed. I have, I think, um... I'm going to, there's a lot of people are answering their, each other's questions, which is just really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I'm gonna do a demo on a couple ones. So just, I think they answered, but I think I will show the one, go to, go to a question I had before yeah. um, about uh, keying. So here's the question. I had two couple questions about uh, sort of visual effects related in Final Cut. In keying green screen, is it best to use the color tools to adjust the green screen before keying? And uh, in general, yes, it will, if your, your color correction, you place your color correction before the key, that color correction will be processed before the key. And you can actually improve a key if you've got, let's say green that isn't quite the right green, um, or you wanna bring up some shadow detail or something. If it's a poorly lit green screen, doing some color correction can help. It's not gonna solve a terrible green screen, but it can definitely help. Uh, the other question was, we shot a product footage on green screen only later to realize that the product has some fonts in green which also get affected during the keying. How can we isolate them? <clears throat> That's a great question. <clears throat> and that is a fix it in post question because during production, somebody didn't notice there was something green. So I have a shot here that some of you will recognize. It goes back some time, but it's a perfect demo of this. So we've got this guy uh, selling Dino Pep and his shirt logo has some green in it. So. If I key him, so I'll go to my effects browser and I'll go to keying and I'll throw on the keyer and I'm not gonna do anything more. It does a decent key. I'm not gonna get into like adjusting it. But if I scrub through this, you can sure see that background. So you have a little background behind him showing through that shirt. Okay, so no, pro no good, what do you do? Easy fix. I'm gonna hold the option key down and drag straight up to make a copy of this clip. And on the copy, I'm going to delete the keyer. Okay, so we're back to where we started. Great, we're back to where we started, but check it out. I'm gonna go to masks in the effects browser and I'm gonna throw a draw mask on this guy and I'm gonna draw a quick mask around this area. This procedure only works if the green part of the green is not hitting an edge where you need to key. If his whole shirt was green, 
forget about it. <laughs> it's not going to work. You can't have green on an edge, but since it's internal, this will work. Now, I'm going to want to um, animate it because right now he moves, but that doesn't. That's no good. But you can just go into the mask and I'm going to set a keyframe for the control points. You can also trans keyform, uh, sorry, keyframe both position and rotation and scale uh, if you wanted to do that. And then I'm going to move way forward to when he's about here. And I'm just going to adjust these control points rather than position, rotation, and scale down to here. And then you'll notice that animates. It's not going to be perfect because he doesn't move in a perfectly linear fashion, but I'm sort of splitting the difference. Each time I'm going about halfway from the last time I added a little keyframe. You can always press Control-V, by the way, um, to re reveal your keyframes. This is showing my animation. And I can see where I've added keyframes. It makes it a little easier to go halfway in between. Um, but now I have this animated mat on this top copy that keeps the green screen from affecting inside. This is also known as a, a core mat or that you're doing inside. Let me adjust it in a few more places. So that's the basic idea of how you can uh, deal with that. So hopefully um, the person who asked this question with the fonts, hopefully those fonts on the product are not on the edge of the product and you'd be able to use this method. Back to you, Steve. All right. So let me, uh, I guess let's see what we have in my question queue in here. All right. So there was a question about um, compositing. Can you go over the different blend modes for layers, normal add, overlay? I always have to test each one to get the look I want. Well, one thing that's cool is that um, we created... I created a web page a while back called Using Blend Modes. And uh, what I'm gonna do is paste the link in the chat. And we caught, we in, in this document, we cover like what they all do. You know, they add, they subtract, they basically apply math to pixels to create different looks. And we created this a while ago, but it's, it's still useful. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, paste that into the chat and you can feel free to look at that. And the thing about these is that, <laughs> you know, you're gonna get different results depending on the footage you're trying to multiply or subtract or darken. It's not just a one size fit, fits all. It, all of this math is looking at not only the color channels, but it's also looking at the brightness values in the, uh, basically in the, in the RGBS color space. So you, you, a lot of times you still have to try them out. I mean, what's nice about these is that they give you a general idea of what they do, but, um, you know, it'll save you some time, for example, if you know what the darken group does. If you know, like, the, these right here are basically, you know, darken, uh, you'll have an idea that, okay, on this footage, I'm going to get this similar result. So that's why it's worth kind of absorbing, at least absorbing what the, what the math is behind these. Okay, cool. Well, so that's my answer. You have the link there. And uh, let's see. Maybe we should get to our some of our live stream stuff. Let's see here. Um... Okay, so a couple questions about er this new era of social distancing. What is your recommend video screen capture software? Okay, so the screen capture software that we use is um, Telestream's ScreenFlow. Um, and you can get it up on the App Store. I forget, last, last time I checked, it was, it was about 100 bucks, I think. Uh, we use that software exclusively, and we, especially for the Mac, it's, it's fantastic. Not only do you capture the screen with it, but it's also a full featured nonlinear editor. In fact, when we do our tutorials, we capture the screen, then we edit in ScreenFlow and then spit out a ProRes file and we do the audio sweetening in Final Cut. So I would say 80, 90% of our tutorial editing happens in ScreenFlow. It doesn't even happen in Final Cut Pro 10. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing I would recommend is that you could use QuickTime Pro, or no, there's no Pro anymore, that QuickTime Player and capture your screen with QuickTime. And I've used that a number of times. The only thing is, what about Zooms? You wanna do callouts and Zooms. Well, here's the great thing. Mark's uh, new plugin, Punch-Ins, you can then capture with QuickTime and use his Punch-Ins to actually go into different portions of the screen and then do highlights exactly like you would in ScreenFlow. So if you wanna save a hundred bucks, you can get, get his plugin for like 30 bucks and then use QuickTime and you pretty much have everything you need. And uh, I haven't done a 
full tutorial with QuickTime and punch-ins yet, but there's no reason I, I couldn't. So there's there's two, two solutions. One's more pricey and one's way cheap. So it depends on the, which way you want to go. All right. So, all right. So let's talk. Steve, yeah. I could build yeah, yeah. on that ahead, a, a little go bit ahead. just to, to, to segue into that. If I can, if I'll share my screen sure. again, um, is that uh, there was a question about um, uh, what are some of the best ways to deal with highlighting or focusing on text and documents in a video? Um, and so uh, it, this is going to be a plug, but I, I really, here's, you're talking about RT punch-ins. And here I have an example uh, of exactly that. So I've got a book and I need to highlight some text. And I've used RT punch-ins if I play this to punch in and then highlight the text. And so and the way I did that, I just used RT punch-ins includes, let me just bring them up here, title inspector and RT punch-ins includes several different highlighting options. So after you punch in on something, I'm just using the line and the line just to tie it all together, has a blend mode applied. So if you go to the inspector here, you can see that we have the multiplied blend mode applied. If I did normal, it would look like this, just a yellow line, but multiply uh, is good for doing something like this. So, and because these are, you know, you can move these any way you want, since it's, it's a, basically a line that you could add arrows and things, but it's great for highlighting text. So you could use um, those lines or you could use circles or rectangles. And if you want more options, Ripple callouts has a whole bunch of different callouts. But um, in combination with punch, RT punch-ins includes these things that let you highlight. It's a great way to highlight text. Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks, uh, thanks for that update. So um, this is fantastic. We're getting some great interaction in the chat window. And uh, I thought what I'd do now is talk about streaming in general, what we, what we use and, uh, you know, our, our setup. Our setup is fairly complex, uh, only because Mark right now is in San Francisco. We're here in Arizona and uh, we're using Skype and we're using OBS. And what I, what I thought I'd do is uh, walk you through a keynote and show you exactly what we're doing. Now, you don't need to use this exact setup but it at least gives you an idea of how we're, how we're doing this. So I'm gonna jump over to a keynote. And jump to my, my scoops. Oh man, all right, second here. Let me switch screens. There we go. All right, so here we go. And I'm gonna to get to this screen here. Uh, OBS is Open Broadcaster, it's free software. And you, we like it because it is free and it's got so much power built into it. And uh, so here's me, that's Steve and my setup. So I, I'm using a Canon C100 with uh, an attached uh, microphone. And that, of course, there's via XLR into the C100. And then we're running out of the C100 into a Blackmagic web presenter over HDMI. Then from HDMI, we're running uh, the output into USB. And now this is the, the really cool part is that what the web presenter does is it tricks any, uh, any of the computer software to thinking it is a webcam. So it takes really nice pictures from a professional camera and, and brings it over, believe it or not, a USB 2 connection to the, to the computer, in this case, the OBS computer. Okay, so there's my Mac. And so how do I get my screen over to OBS? So what we do is we take a Thunderbolt out using a Thunderbolt cable from my Mac over to Travis's Mac, his iMac a Pro that he's running, and we use what's called a Thunderbolt bridge. So everything I'm doing on the screen is over Thunderbolt over to, over to his computer. Okay, now as far as audio is concerned, I need to get the audio out of my Mac into Skype. Well, actually into that computer, sorry. So we run a... 3.5 millimeter stereo RCA into this into this uh, A to D converter. I think it's from Focusrite, and then again USB. So we're running both the the picture and the sound from my computer over USB into Travis's Mac. And then so I'm able to monitor the stream on YouTube and monitor your chats. I also have an iPad, and I know this is Duet now, but I'm using Catalina, so 
poor duet. Um, I'm sure they're pretty sad that this is features now built into Catalina, but it creates an extended desktop so I can monitor everything on my iPad. All right, so that's uh, over lightning cable. So I have a lightning connected to my iPad where I can monitor everything. Now let's talk about Mark. Uh, Mark, is, uh, he uses a Lumix, I think it's G5, and he uses a uh, GH5S, sorry. <laughs> He's got a, uh, a lavalier microphone. And I don't know if this company even exists anymore, but it, this, this makes this juiced link. And what it allows you to do is connect a XLR microphone, a professional mic, into this box. And then out of the juice link, you come out 3.5 uh, into, into the camera. So he's getting professional audio into his, his Panasonic camera um, through this juice link box. And then, of course, he's going to need to get his picture out of that camera. So HDMI out into his web presenter. And then from there, USB to his MacBook Pro. I know it's an iMac there, but he has a MacBook Pro. And it goes USB in. And that's coming in to Skype. So he's, uh, the, his Skype feed is seeing the output of the web presenter. And then what we're doing then is Skype. We're dialing them up. And we're sending the Skype feed into OBS, and we're using this technology called NDI. Um, NDI was developed by NewTek, and it's a te technology that allows us to take synced audio vis visuals from the internet and keep them in sync and allows us to route them however we want. So we're taking his Skype feed into OBS and then routing it. Okay, so that's this is our setup. This is what we're doing right now. Okay, now, all that to say, all that to say, we're, we're, we're go I'm going to be simplifying this soon, and I want to talk about this because this thing is freaking awesome. I can't wait to get it. You can't even get these right now. You go Just try to find one. Uh, they're back-ordered everywhere. And it is this B&H, uh, excuse me, the Blackmagic Design ATEM Mini Switcher. This thing is fantastic because it has four HDMI inputs. It has USB output. So the USB output goes to Skype or your computer. And what's interesting is like that the web presenters I show you limits your resolution to 720p. But this box uh, gives you a full 1080p out to whatever, um, to whatever computer you, you want. It's still over USB, but it's 1080p. And so the setup is gonna look something, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be playing around with the configuration, but the setup in the future will look something more like this, where we have um, the computer running, the computer screen will be HDMI into one of the inputs of the ATEM, the HDMI from the camera will be into another input of the ATEM, and then we'll take the USB out and run it into, in this case it says Skype, but just picture that computer, that's, that's gonna be Travis's OBS computer. So we're gonna be running the USB signal to the OBS computer. And what I like about this is again, not only the better picture quality, but it does, Picture in picture, it has transitions built in. It has a still store. It has, um, <coughs> it's, you can do up to four inputs. And uh, it can even be programmed externally over ethernet. So really impressive little box. And here's the, here's the thing about this thing. It's only $300. So again, Black Magic is, I feel like they made a category killer. I mean, who, who's, who's gonna compete with this? The, the nearest thing, that's close to this is a thousand dollars. So um, I would say that this is this is really a, a game changing piece of hardware for a lot of people. So that's that's what we're waiting on. We're going to um, be doing I'll do some tests and we'll let you know how it goes. And speaking of which, I just want to point out something. Um, I'm going to jump over to my browser for a sec. Um, so Travis. He's the guy that's running everything behind me right now, and he's like super smart. He created a webinar called Live Streaming with OBS, and you can see he kept everything that I just talked about plus more, how to actually use OBS is in this tutorial here. It's 39 bucks, and um, what, what I'm gonna suggest is I'm gonna bring, he's gonna bring up a code. If you wanna learn how we stream and how OBS works, uh, just use that code. You can purchase a tutorial, and you can learn all about how we do our live streaming. So OBS is just, again, a separate topic, um, but that's it. That's what we do. So yeah. That's great. Good, good, good question, yeah. Steve, how, with the ATM switcher 
um, how I connect to you? Do I just do what I'm still using a black magic web presenter box over here? Yeah, I mean, you well, real the thing is, is that the <laughs> this ATEM switcher really eliminates the need for that box. So I'm probably gonna put that box on eBay soon enough because it, it really takes the place of it. Um, it also has an so, HD. But, but I, would I need one of them as well? No, no, you would you wouldn't need one. The only reason I well, I like the I, what I like the idea for me is having my computer screen and my um, my uh, my camera in one box. So I just I would do the switching. So that's one less thing he has to do because he's doing all of the audio and video switching right. on OBS, and so he has to create all these scenes. See, with me, I just like okay, I know it's the uh, the uh, switcher's right in front of me. Like I'm gonna go to my screen, tap. I'm on my screen. That gets set. Right. So right. so yeah, that's what you would do. You would tap that button. You'd have your interface, and it would. I don't, I don't, Charles, I don't think he should have to share his screen then, would he? I mean, um, or would he if he's got if it? If he's doing the switching, it would, I don't think so. We, we don't think we so. That's to something we have it. to test. But we think that you, you should be able to just go from your camera right to your interface using the switch in the front. So, but I, so I would need one of those. Well, you needs, needs a power. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the chart didn't include... So I didn't know if I still use web presenter, I use that. Okay, so, but really, if you have multiple people, they each need to have one of those no. if they're in remote locations. Well, no, not necessarily. What, I, what I'm saying is that you're, you're one person. I'm saying if, if you have up to four inputs, what's really great about it is to me, is if you were, like, you were teaching guitar and you, or a piano or something and you wanted one camera on you, one camera on, the, on your, on your right, strings, right. one no, camera on the that. frets. But that's really what it's, the, the best part of it is. Um, I like the idea of getting it only because I can then just with one with one uh, tap I can switch between my camera and my computer and then Travis doesn't have to worry about this and on your end you wouldn't have to share I don't believe you would have to share your screen it would just be tap because then now it's just a camera source being sent to Skype mm -hmm. so cool okay yeah yeah great all right cool. that's awesome so yeah. um a bunch of questions. Let me try to ask, answer a few of them, and I do have a couple other ones from our from the people asked earlier. Yeah. Um, how to get a drop down menu published in Apple Motion? So uh, this is Atya, and Atya, what I recommend to you, you need to publish a rig. Um, so you need to learn about widgets and rigs. Widgets are checkboxes, sliders, and drop down menus that you can set up in Motion, and then you rig parameters to those widgets and then you publish them to Final Cut Pro. We have a complete tutorial. It's covered actually, some of that is covered in the Warp Speed Motion one that's on sale for $10 right now. But there's a more in-depth one called Rigging and Publishing in Motion. Uh, maybe Travis could throw a link up there that goes into depth about how you do that. Um, also, I saw one for, let's see. Uh, I shot a movie with Mini DV. What's the best output codec or format I should export it for HD and best resolution? Well, you, you can't get more resolution out of it. You've got mini DV 640 by 480. Upresing it to HD isn't going to make it look any better. Um, the only thing you could potentially transcode it to ProRes so that it could stand up a little bit better under heavy color correction. But mini DV is, is very low resolution and you know it's the color space is limited. Um, you're just not a lot you can do with it. I would just leave it in its default state. I mean, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mini DV tapes from past shooting from years and decades ago um, that I've transferred all onto hard drive for archiving purposes just in their default format. I wouldn't do anything else to them because if you did transcode them to ProRes, it'll make them much bigger and there's just no real quality gain you're going to get out of it. I wouldn't do anything else with them. Chris Torella uh, had a point because I don't believe that that juice link box that I showed you that, you know, it's converting your, uh, your mic into the U S uh, con converting yeah. it. Um, I don't even think they're, a, you can, you guys could check. Um, but I don't even think they're in business anymore. Yeah, um, uh, but, uh, Chris Torella mentioned that beach tech has a, so there's a company called beach tech that has a very similar box to what the Riggy did where so you can run an XLR in and then a mini out. Um, that's a fairly common thing that, I think people, a lot of people have DSLRs and whatnot with the little 3.5 jack. So you want to check out Beach Thanks, Thanks for that, Chris. Really good, really good point. 
Okay, so just just to remind folks, we're, we're trying to skim through these. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions trying to skim backwards. If you do want to make sure your question gets answered, if you click that dollar sign just to make a, a nominal contribution, it just lets us see it and post it up there. But otherwise, we'll, we'll keep scrubbing through these. Oh, can you publish the punch and plug in URL? Sure. Let me grab that right now and I will. I will put it right in the chat window because I saved that in case you'd want it. So copy. So here it is. So that's the punch-ins deal. Um, well, Steve, I could do a, an answer another one of the previous ones. Yeah, uh, I just want to, care. there's a couple of fast ones in here. Uh, De sure, go for De it. Uh, Declan, Casey, um, we get this question, I, I can't even tell you how many times a week, or uh, you know, when's Final Cut 10.5? We, even if we knew, we, we couldn't possibly even mention it. We, we, we just, we don't know. And uh, this, this just Apple is a highly secretive company, so we can always speculate. And uh, but we're the same boat you are. We don't we don't know. So just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. And to, to Carlos who say, hey, you guys split up. You always used to do the tutorials together in Petaluma, Paraluma, Petaluma, California. <laughs> Paraluma. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> we're, uh, we're doing things a little more efficiently. That's all. Is that 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 facility is no longer available where we used to shoot these in a bunch of batch. Matches. Um, so we've we've changed the format to do this Ripple Live, so we can be more interactive with you guys. We still do Mac Break Studio every every week, sometimes two a week, um, but we often do those separately. Uh, and then when we when we get together, we do do stuff together. But we are in two separate locations. But we want to keep all the content coming out uh, to you guys as much as possible. So uh, uh, we're just using the technology. You know, we can't get together now anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah. Luckily, we've got all this set up and running. It was like we were predicting this. Um, let's see. So I did want to answer, if, yeah. if I can share my screen, um, yeah. I did want to answer a question here. Um, there are a couple ones. Let me go back up. Um, within Final Cut, there was, uh, please talk about managing sound libraries. Like many editors, I collect sound effects and royalty for music libraries. I have about 45,000. But Final Cut makes it so hard to work with them. First, getting into Final Cut to see them. Second, Final Cut's forcing them to load at once, not sorting, allowing you to collapse, not allowing you to collapse a folder, not allowing you to create favorites, not allowing you to reveal and finder. So I'm just going to show you, first of all, if you're really doing a lot of this, you want an asset manager. I put two links down here. You want to maybe look at Kino. Is it separate from Final, Final Cut? A standalone MAM, Media Asset Management. Um, but I will show you what I do in here in Final Cut. So I'll go to Final Cut. And you'll see I have a library here called Stock Photos, Video, and Audio. So I actually have all, all of my stock videos, video, video, and audio in one library, which is probably too much. I should probably split it. You can see I just had to load it there, and it takes a minute. Um, I don't have quite as many. I have about 7,000 in here, not 45,000. But I'm able to use the smart collections to drill down and look at uh, you know, just stills or just audio pretty easily. And then I also have, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Keyword collections based on the folders they originally came from. Because I had all of these stored in folders on my hard drive. So I can jump right to acoustic, um, you know, or ambience, uh, things like that. I can jump right to some BFX, bokeh effects, things that I've got in here. So I have one massive library and I, I have it, and then I drag what I need into my project library, the library I'm actually working on. That's just kind of how I set it up. You know, it is searchable. I can do finds on it. And if I, any particular clip, you can always right click and choose reveal and finder. And it'll show you exactly where that clip is located. Here's the uh, menu that comes up. Sorry, it came up on my other screen. Let me see if I can drag it over. Oh, I know it's not letting me drag over right now because I'm in um, full screen mode. But anyway, you just reveal and finder and you'll see it there. So. That's what I do. It works for me. Um, I'll probably break this up to have separate photo, video, and audio so it doesn't all have to load. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it works well, and it's easy to search. If I put it Option Command 2 in List View, you know, it makes it easier to see. You can search on any of these names. Um, so if I just type in here Bokeh, B-O-K-E-Y. Uh, no, it's not doing that. There, I spelled it wrong. So you can do searches, you can you know find things. I find it works pretty well, but if you really want to, do, if you got 45,000, you might want to look at, at something like Kino.
Okay, so thanks, Mark. Thanks for that. Um, all right, so I'm just going back up to the list again. Peter Downing had quick questions about, okay. All oh, right, that was more of a statement there. Um, all right. Yeah, there's just so many questions. By the way, really appreciate all the feedback. This is this is really great. So, uh, David, I answered that for you. It's about uh, resolve live streams. We're we're actually toying with the idea. Um, Mark and I, have, you know, been digging into resolve quite a bit the past few uh, years. And there was one question in particular that we 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 get all the time. Is like, do you using resolve? Use Final Cut? What are you using? And we both have the same uh, answer: is that we use Final Cut for editing. And uh, we use Resolve for a lot of our color grading. And, and, and now with uh, their Fairlight, which is getting really, really sophisticated in terms of its, its functionality and power, we're using uh, Fairlight for a lot of our audio work um, from a day-to-day from a -day, uh, post standpoint. Uh, we don't, and I've said this before, I, I don't look at it as an either-or scenario. It's like all Final Cut all the time, all Resolve all the time. It's just we use the tool that we like to use. And... Primarily, Mark and I edit in Final Cut just because of the speed, but there are just some tools in Final Cut, just, just uh, excuse me, some tools in Resolve that just don't exist in Final Cut that we need to use Resolve for. And one of the big ones, and we can make a list of them, uh, the big ones is a lot of people are shooting with a Blackmagic Cinema camera, and you, there's no B-RAW support in Final Cut Pro 10. And that's, a, <laughs> that's the next question in line that's almost as popular as when is 10.5 coming out? I don't know. I, I don't know, you know what the holdup is, B-RAW support, and I don't want to speculate. I'm sure high-level discussions are being had or not had, but yeah, I think it would be good to have B-RAW level support um, in, in Final Cut, but uh, if you shoot with that cinema camera, there, you have no choice. If you want to edit the raw data, you gotta, you got to use Resolve. Uh, plus, you know, it has amazing built-in trackers. Their, their color page is, in my opinion, unrivaled. Everybody that creates color tools uses DaVinci Resolve as it's, it's the benchmark. Um, and, you know, Mark, Mark just did a complete, like, advanced color grading tutorial. And the, the, the speed at which you're able to work, we always say Final Cut for speed and editing, you can't get faster than Resolve in terms of speed in, as, a, as color grading. If you have literally hundreds of clips that you have to grade, there's so many amazing workflows that will, that will just shave off so many mouse clicks in time. And I really encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and watch some of Mark's short subjects on color grading because especially the ones on workflow because you'll get a real sense that it's all about speed. It's all about how efficient you can work. So we're, we're, we're huge fans of the color page and uh, we, we use both. So I know that was somewhat of a long-winded answer, Mark, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to chime in there. No, I think I think you covered it perfectly. I think that's right on. Um, I'd like to, there was a question about upgrading to Catalina and it reminded me we had a bunch of previous questions about Catal Catalina. So I thought that was worth yeah. talking about for a minute. And um, cause I, I wanna share my screen on a couple items on that. So the first thing about Catalina that I would talk to is if you have not upgraded yet, before you do, um, I want you to do this. You wanna go to your system preferences under the Apple menu by the way, a fast way there is if you hold the option key down, you see it says system information. That's just by holding the option key down. But you could also go to system preferences and then um, I have to, sorry, I have to, um, I'm not able to show another window there. There we go. Um, so in system preferences, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blowing this uh, about this Mac. If you go to about this Mac and then click on system report, so about this Mac system report, or just so I can do this correctly, you go hold the option key down under the Apple menu and choose system information. Either way, will bring you to the same spot here. You want to in hard in um, you want to go down to software to applications. So I'm in software. I'm looking at applications, and I'm already on Catalina. So you're not going to see what I'm talking about here. If you're on Mojave, this takes a minute to load. It's going to show all the applications on this machine. But if you're on an earlier operating system like Mojave or High Sierra, there's going to be an option here, a, a column that'll say basically 32-bit or 64-bit. It doesn't exist here in Catalina because everything has to be 64-bit. But you want to do this if you haven't upgraded yet because you can click on the top uh, of that column to sort and you can see all the 32-bit applications that you have 
that will no longer work in Catalina, just so that you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, so that, that's number one, sort of caution about before we move to Catalina. Um, number two is that if you, you should open up all your, all your libraries because you'll be prompted to convert any legacy media. You might have some old codecs that won't be supported, supported in Catalina because they're not 64-bit. And your chance to convert them is, is now because once you update to Catalina, Final Cut will no longer be able to, to um, transcode that old media. It's not gonna be able to read it because you're gonna be in a 64-bit universe. You can, however, if you are already in Catalina, let's say you already did it, and now you're opening some old projects and you can't see certain clips because they're very old codecs or not supported codecs. I wanna give you a couple of um, options for that. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna give you a link about dealing with incompatible media. I'm gonna post that right now. So you can, this is an Apple support document that explains what codecs are incompatible if you're moving to Catalina. And the second thing is if you've already gone to Catalina, you can use that Kino link that I showed earlier uh, and I'll post it again because you can use Kino to do that um, conversion of that legacy media. So I'll post that as well. So just a couple of things, about, things to think about. Catalina is a bigger jump uh, than any of the system upgrades we have from recently. Um, it's a way bigger jump because it's 64-bit. And Steve, I don't know where you are with this. I, I transitioned when I got this new machine a couple of months ago because it came with Catalina pre-installed and forced me to go to it. Uh, and uh, it's mostly been very, very smooth for me. I just discovered today I didn't have some LUTs installed, but that, that's not related to Catalina. That's just related to having a new machine. Uh, and I'm finding it works very well. You know, it's funny. I, I was, you know, kind of paranoid about jumping over to Catalina for, for a while. Um, I haven't had any issues. It's been pretty stable. And, you know, I... You know, it's in terms of the all the eight bit codec scare, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be overrun old versions of, you know, my motion JPEG codec or my Sorensen codec or whatever. It's like, oh yeah, do you, anyway. I I don't have it that problem. I mean, all my all the stuff I've worked with the last ten years has been you know completely compliant with uh, the sixty four bit architecture Mark just referred to, in including yeah. Mini DV by the yeah, way. Just, yeah, yeah, just I, to, including Mini DV. Yeah, That'll I work. think it was. I really thought it was much ado about nothing. I people like to freak out about stuff like that. It's like, oh, I'm not going to be able to open my video. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, the only thing that I do, <laughs> honestly, I you guys could chime in about this. I I, I don't like. I mean, Catalina. I, it definitely has some things I don't like. Uh, it's egregious security lockdown. I mean, almost every app I stored, I know we got to give you, you got to go into the preferences and give it access to this and give, make sure the mic's available for that. And no, no, well, that drive would never recognize that. You got to let your Catalina know that's a legit drive. And it's, it's a little bit mind blowing. Uh, sometimes uh, Catalina is really trying to tamp down and make, make it as secure as possible. But I find it's a little intrusive sometimes. Um, just, you know, it is what it is. But uh, the other thing I, I don't like about it, and if you've ever had to reinstall an operating system, most people don't know that Catalina actually creates two separate partitions. Even though you have one partition, there's an invisible partition for storing all of your data that you don't see uh, at all. It's just not visible. So it's something you got to be aware of when you're reformatting your drives. And it, it, there's, there's a little bit of a trick to it. Um, I'm just kind of warning you ahead of time. They're just, they, they've decided to sequester data from apps and OS stuff into two separate partitions and you, you don't see one of them. So um, I found that out uh, the hard way. Anyway, I uh, don't want to go too deep into that, but that's another thing I'm not, I'm not crazy about. But other than that, I, I actually, my favorite part of Catalina is the screenshot of Catalina because I spent a lot of time over there on that island scuba diving. And so it's, you know, I'll just, I love the screenshot. I love, I love seeing Catalina at night and then in a day and in the morning. At night, dark yes, mode. Yes, in dark yeah. mode. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Do we, um, I, I don't, I can't see what our current attendance is. It's about 20 after 12. I just, we'll keep asking, answering questions. I want to get a sense how many folks are, are still here. We have uh, 268 uh, in the chat. In Still the, here, you guys, man, it's sticking it out. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You're right. So we can, we can keep going if you, you have some more questions. Now the time, um, you know, we'll 
like I said, we're, we're, we're in a community here and what else is there to do? <laughs> this thing. <laughs> Right, they talk about final cut. There was a, there was a question the guy had about kind of organizing a larger event. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, here I'll, I'll show the, the question uh, was uh, actually I'll show a couple questions here if you're sharing my screen. Um, I archive all my libraries each time Final Cut Pro 10 is updated. When I open an old library, Final Cut Pro needs to update it. Do I have to update all my libraries each time there is an update, or would the latest updates always read and update old libraries? So you can see I wrote the answer down here, I would. Um, most of the time it doesn't matter. You could probably skip a couple um, releases of Final Cut and then open a library that hasn't been open for a while and it'll probably open fine. But we have an instance, I think it was from 10.0.3 to 10.1 where the library model changed. Um, and today, if people still have libraries in that old library model, I don't know if some of you guys remember back when events uh, and projects were all separate. There was like two separate total interfaces. Uh, if you still have those old projects and never upgraded them, it like in like 10.1 or 10.2, you can't open those anymore unless you go get one of those, like an old version of 10.1 to first bring the 10.0 into 10.1 and then open it again. Long-winded, but a way to say that, you know, I probably would go through and open your libraries and update them to the current version be before it, when a new version's coming out, like there's a big new version coming out, um, you know, save your existing version of Final Cut. I have versions going back, you know, six, seven, eight versions, so I can always open an old one because I have customers that come, they'll come to my edit suite and they'll be like, oh, I built this back on whatever on High Sierra and I can't upgrade because my machine's too old. So I can always basically downgrade my Final Cut and work on their project on my own machine. So I'd save your Final Cut version and I would tend to open up those um, old libraries and update them. Um, so, and then the second, the, the sort of a related question was about library organization. Somebody setting up a library for a documentary and asking, should I put each interview in a separate event, separate event for B-roll stills and graphics and stuff. And then how do you do a smart, how do you do a keywords search across all those libraries. So I thought I'd just show, I have um, a library where I had to do this, and I, I generally do create separate events. So I have this one called Cafe Zoetrope, which is a, a cafe in San Francisco, which uh, when this is all over and you guys are in San Francisco, please stop by for a visit. It's, it's Francis Ford Coppola's cafe, and it's got some amazing photographs on the wall of him and uh, George Lucas and Marty and you know everybody from back in the day. It's really cool. But I, I did a series of interviews there, and you can see I have, um, and shoots, I have an event for specific shoot days, shoot on, uh, this is April of 2019, uh, another shoot on the next day. I have a, a, an event just for historical photographs. I have an event for a separate interview. I have an event for music that I was gonna use in this, um, event for B-roll. So I created a bunch of separate events just to stay organized, and then I would start bringing these things into specific timelines. So I do recommend that. Now it makes it a little harder to search because when you do a search, a search is always event specific. It searches on the, the uh, event. If I go into cafe, go food. I'm just gonna type food here and give it a minute. Food. Okay, it's giving me two results there, but if I go and create a smart collection, if I go and choose file, new, library smart collection, so library wide, and I'll call it food, and I'll double click it, and I'll add a search term of the keywords, and I'll say, don't uncheck all, and I'll just go down and locate where we have food. There's a food one right there. Okay, and now I'm seeing all clips that have the keyword food across all events in this library. So um, just a useful way to be able to search across all of your events if you've done this and created a bunch of separate events for your library. There's a question from Kurt that I thought you might answer um, about, and he, he did actually ask this question, Kurt Bailey asked this question uh, when we sent out our survey. Yeah, he's, uh, any thoughts on making editor producer notes on a storyline, i.e. what B-roll works here, basic titles is some way of indicating span span of a segment. Um, 
I thought that might be related to like how you break down some of your interviews because I think he mentioned he uses a lot of uh, sound on tape stuff. Um, but I think um, I think it's just a matter of I'm, I think if I understand you, Kurt, you're you're asking about uh, notes on a storyline. Um, I'm assuming that you want you have these long clips and you want to create little segments where you're commenting on those segments so you can quickly find them. I think that's just a matter of making ranges. Um, I think that's what you're asking. Hey, um, uh, yeah. can, you, can you jump, jump can you Keyword just, ranges. yeah, can you just jump in and show that to him really quick since he's did a super chat. Thanks for that, by the way, Kurt. Yeah. I'm just looking for some, uh, well, one second, I'm looking for a little bit of B roll that I have. That's, uh, here, let's go to the bar for, that's not any video. Let's go to all video, my B roll and see if there's something that would make sense here. So um, I'll, I'll just take a shot here. I and mean, this is, these are gonna be short, but so here I have a shot. Let me turn off audio scrubbing here. Um, and if I only wanted to mark a specific range of this that was useful, I could hit, hit I and O. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna put this option command two into list view. So I and O and then F and then uh, tab and down arrow. We'll open that up. Um, and then I can name this fa that favorite that range and call it, um, you know, outside awning. It's not a great example, but you can identify. Basically, I've got a, a favorite at a range. So I didn't do a I didn't do a a keyword range. I did a favorite based on that range and named it. But you could do that either as a favorite or you could do it as keywords, depending on what makes more sense for your workflow. There's just so many options here. You can see I've already got it keyworded for the entire clip, but you've got B-roll. You could also use keywords for specific ranges if you're using the same keyword a lot. Um, for the interview itself, I generally will use Builder um, to get all those sound bites identified and bring them into Final Cut um, because Builder is a way I can basically build a paper cut first. And we have a whole tutorial about uh, cutting interviews in Final Cut Pro 10 where we go over that workflow. Yep. I'm just answering this one question there. This is really great to answer questions um, right when you're doing the other stuff. So, all right. Cool. All right. So there was another question that Jacob Rush posted. Any recommendations on working in Final Cut Pro 10 but have other editors using different NLE? Um, I found Send to X off the Mac store works great for Premiere. So Jacob, by the way, thanks for your super chat. Really appreciate it. Um, so you know, XML is kind of the glue uh, to get content from one NLE to the other. I think unlike Resolve, that where you can bring in clips, where you can bring in sequences, XML, AAF, EDL, uh, Final Cut pretty much has only one way, and like you guys correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's only one way to get a sequence from another NLE, uh, and that's XML. So uh, Premiere or Resolve, you can export um, an XML and should be able to import that into, into Final Cut. I don't do a lot of workflow that direction. Um, it's possible, so I, uh, maybe some of you can comment on that, but, it's, but XML is your is your tool, it's your glue to bring in your content from other editors. I, I don't really work with Premiere, uh, so I, I, I could you know, talk about how to do it in Resolve. It's fairly straightforward, but just not a Premiere guy, but I'm certainly, it's certainly possible. So um, Moniz had a question. A lot of my clients have asked me to convert their wedding videos from Blu-ray to a digital format. Right. After ripping the disc, the original aspect ratio is 1440 by 1080. Should I convert it to 1920 by 1080? Um, not necessarily when you bring it into final cut, the reason it's 1440 by 1080 is because it's a non-square pixel aspect ratio. And, um, in final cut, if you select that clip in the browser and go to the inspector, uh, you should check the, the interpretation of that clip. I don't have an example here to be able to show you that, um, cause I don't have a 1440 by clip, 1440 by 1080 clip. Uh, but you could check that pixel aspect ratio and adjust it if need be. Um, if you can't, then you could always stretch it out to 1920 by 1080 and it should look correct, but it'd be better to use the uh, pixel aspect ratio. And I'm just seeing if I can bring that up anywhere. 
I haven't had to do this in a long time. Um, it's not a browser data field. There's a frame size, but not aspect ratio. Yeah, do you have any more on that, Steve? Because I think um, I'm just looking for where I would find that if I don't already have a, I don't have a, a clip like that to check out. For what? So I was answering a question. <laughs> Sure. If you've got a clip that's 1440 by 1080, right? And um, the answer is, if it looks squeezed, then you'll can need to stretch it out either by changing the pixel aspect ratio, or by rescaling it to 1920 by yeah, 1080. It, one it, or the other. Yeah, it's interesting because what what they do to because that material came off of a Blu-ray. In order to save bits, because all it's, it's all about bit budgeting on an optical disc. They end up saving space by actually creating a compressed version of the of the HD signal, and that's why you get this weird uh, squeezed uh, file coming off the Blu-ray. Yeah, you can you could scale it up using uh, Final Cut, or you could use compressor, and they have a bunch of uh, um, scale and, oh, uh, and padding controls. Uh, compressor is going to give idea. you much more accurate pixel. I mean, when you can bring it back, you could stretch it back out. The the tools in compressor are much better. Um, and I would use that be just because you, you'll be able to you'll be able to see it in the preview window. You can save a you can save a preset for it. And you can bring in all your BD BD uh, converted files, drop the preset on, and spit them all out properly. And I just posted a link to Moni, Moniz at Moniz that, that we just came out um, with a compressor tutorial, and I, I posted it in uh, I posted it I put it in there again. And uh, Travis, who's running our OBS, he created it. Actually, we kind of co-created it. And we have a bunch of really amazing compression recipes in there, like how, you know, how to do the padding and whatnot. So I would say I would use compressor to, to, to do that. Yeah, oh, totally actually, agree. Actually, uh, Zward uh, uh, Vries says, put, with HDV, put it in a timeline of 1920, 11, 1108, and it's okay. Oh, that's a really great suggestion. So... Uh, there's, there's his tip. Put it in a 1920 by 1108. Is that the, do you mean? Sounds 10, weird. Yeah. I don't know if you meant Yeah, I think he meant 1080. 1080. He, he might have meant Yeah, 1080. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Michael Roper, thank you very much for your, uh, for your super chat contribution. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Hey, and you, you guys, if we're not getting to your question, feel free to post it again. Cause we're, you know, we're trying to scroll back through this long window. Um, but just feel free to post it again and we'll try to do it. Uh, have you seen any plugins to edit 360 videos such as raw video stitching? And I know Alex Golmer answered this. Final Cut doesn't stitch your 360 video for for you, and no no NLE is going to do it because every camera does it differently. You've got to use usually there's software that comes with the camera, whether it's a GoPro Fusion or a uh, you know the the one what's the one you have, Steve? Oh, the, I used well, yeah. the one. Yeah, the 360 One X. Um, 361R, yeah, 361X. 361X. Yeah, I mean, I also said that he, he used the word raw, which I go, okay, uh, that's a lot of data. If you're gonna, if you're at that level, I wouldn't. You're gonna need to use Mystica, which is you know a professional. Yeah, it's raw. 360. Like, Mystica yeah, raw 360. Is, is the standard, but it's really expensive. It's super expensive. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, but generally you, you the, you're going to use the what the came with a camera or absolutely Mystica if you're doing like very high end 360 stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Let's see here, other questions. Feel free to post them at the bottom. Is Final Cut really that bad for color grading? Uh, I, 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 I answered that. God no, no. Well, no, that? I, I, I well, that? Okay. Yeah, some, I, I guess maybe I was a little too animated. Uh, I, I didn't say it was bad. <laughs> I didn't say it was bad. I said it's not as fast. Um, and if you have short form projects, great. It's great. But if, you, if you're cutting something, like a, a color grading, a documentary or a feature film, you're going to feel the pain really quickly. Uh, in, in terms of speed, in terms yeah. of speed, that's the bottom line. I see what yes. you mean. In terms of speed, yeah. right? Not in terms of quality. Not in terms of quality. Yeah. Just the Resolve has workflow tools um, that allow you to work much more quickly. Plus a control surface. I mean, you combine a control surface with all those workflow tools that allow you to apply the same grade to multiple clips or update grades on multiple clips and and group clips and and do remote versus local grades and do versions. There's just a lot of things. But in terms of the tool set for color grading, Final Cuts are it's great. It's a great tool set and it allows you to do pretty much everything you need to do. It's just gonna take a little bit longer because there's not a lot of 
those workflow, workflow tools besides kind of copying and pasting grades from one clip to another. Yeah. So people are asking about the code for the uh, discount. I'm, pu I'm putting that back into the chat right now. I brought it back up. Okay, so you brought it back up, but there it is. Um, there's, there's, the, there's the code. Okay, awesome. Here, I, I, so I, I'm going back a little bit. Ivan Battle says, so I chose copy to library storage location in my preferences and upon import it creates separate folders outside my library. So, th so this is the problem. Preferences is not where you set your storage location. You set your storage location for your media in the library inspector. In preferences, you can toggle between that location that you specified in the library inspector or leaving clips where they are unless that's grayed out because you're importing from a card or an archive. So you don't use preferences to set the location. It's all dependent on what you set in your library inspector and then whether you chose to override that or not when you import it um, is where it will place it. I, I've never seen, you know, Final Cut may create separate folders if it's copying a lot of data in, but they'll all be in the location that you specified there. Okay, uh, great, thanks. So Mike, Mike Thomas, um, this, thank you for the super chat. In the photo and audio sidebar, I can't seem to access the GarageBand loops and sound effects. I search online and find nothing about it, how to do this. Do you have a tip? Yes, I do have a tip. Um, first of all, what you're, you're gonna cut to my screen there. If I go, to, if I go over to the, uh, the, to the, what do you call it? This photos and sound browser in a Final Cut Pro 10, you'll notice that um, I, I think it was specifically GarageBand loops and effects. Okay, let me clarify something. Um, GarageBand loops do not show up in Final Cut Pro 10. They just don't. Uh, what does show up in Final Cut Pro 10 are the projects you create. Or what, I don't know what the GarageBand's term for projects is. I don't know, I'm drawing a, drawing a blank, but. It's, it's projects, you're Yeah, right. it's a project. So if you create, if you create uh, Mike, a GarageBand project, that should show up under GarageBand right here in this little window. Um, assuming, and this is this is the point I want to make. Assuming you have the latest version of GarageBand, the latest operation, and the latest version of Final Cut, all of those have to be simpatico. Otherwise, you may not see it there. Um, but yeah, if you if you create basically what GarageBand does, you make, work with these loops, you make this song, and then the song becomes available. But it's not it's not editable. You can't like break it down. You, it basically treats it like a like a flattened AIF file, really, and then you drag it from that window into your timeline. So um, you're not gonna get any of that inside of Final Cut. That's why you aren't finding anything, so we just answered that for you. Cool. Um, all right. Yeah, there's a lot of, Peter Hitchcock. I know, Peter, you, you asked a question. I have to see if I can bring it up. It's, it's, it's a fairly, it's a fairly long question, Peter. I was trying to wonder if we, this basically is an HDR question. See if I can uh, if I can find it um, in here. Uh, yeah, there was I I was pretty smart to actually color code everything, so I know where the color grading questions are. Um, let's see here. It has, and Mark's Mark's fairly up on the HDR stuff, and so hopefully he could be able to answer these. Uh, Nope, that's not it. I'm looking for it, Peter. Looking for the one you specifically asked for. All right, so. It'd be nice to be able to search. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, I know. Um, so maybe you could post specifically what you have, your, your question is. I can't, for some, I, have, I, I just don't know what your actual um, question is. So maybe you could put it in there, Peter, and we'll, we'll be happy to answer it for you. Awesome. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, infotainment asks any option to search fonts in Final Cut. Yes and no. I mean, there's no, you can't just say, hey, you know, this. Well, let me let me put it this way. Let me add a title, Control T, um, and tell me if I need to share my screen, yeah, Steve, please. to do this. Yeah, yeah, please Steve. share it. Yeah. Okay. Sharing. Okay. Thanks, Travis. So if I've got a title, I've got a title here, and and I wanna change the font, and I've got this pop-up menu of all these fonts. Um, one thing you could do when you click on this, if I know my font starts with S, if I just hit S, it'll jump to the S's. If it starts with A, I tap A, it'll jump to the A's. 
so you can do something faster than just scrolling through this. You can jump to them is, is one thing. And the other thing, uh, no, actually that's in motion. In motion, you can actually access any custom font collections you've set up in Fontbook to grab them. Uh, but in here, that's, that's basically all you can do is, is sort of start typing the name of the font that you want and it'll jump to that. It'll jump to that. If I type uh, FR, it'll go to, you know, Fresco in this case. Um, but that's about, that's about the limit of it, as far as I know. So there was a question that uh, Moni's asked about um, deinterlacing. You know, a lot of us have legacy footage from SD that's, you know, got deinterlacing. The best way to do it is bring that into Compressor. There's actual options in Compressor for deinterlacing your material and turning it into Progressive. So Compressor, that's the answer. Uh, you can't do it directly in Final Cut Pro 10, I believe. I, I just... There's more. There's actually more refinement tools. So even if you could do it, I would still choose compressor just because the amount of refinement tools uh, is is better. Especially, you know, you got you know you start pulling out. You're essentially mm -hmm. pulling out half the half the information when you deinterlace something. You just are. I mean, cause but if the th there is, I, I was there. There is in Final Cut. If you select a clip and go to the info inspector, um, I don't know if my screen's still available. But there's a deinterlace checkbox that you can uh, click. Yeah, yeah, I forgot um, about that. That will deinterlace footage. But I, I think I agree with you. Compressors are a way to go if you want to deinterlace a lot of footage. But if you just want to see the impact, you could click that deinterlace checkbox. Brad, Brad Didymus, Brad Didymus, thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, yes, we are definitely um, practicing social distancing here today. So Ken, Ken is asking, can you embed closed captions in compressor for Blu-ray discs? Um, so, you're, so we're talking about the difference between open caption and closed, right? So closed captions are the ability to um, allow the user to turn them on and off. So with regard to uh, you, you know social platforms, that's a good thing to have, open, uh, op, uh, excuse me, closed captions. Cl um, open captions are the ones that are actually like, burned into the video burned in you can't change them they're always there uh i don't believe you can do that in compressor i have to, I have to double check but it's something you can certainly do in final cut you can export your movie you know, it'll, take, it'll take all those subtitle streams when you export it and then you can burn them in as subtitles um on the way out so it'll it'll come out of final cut with the titles burned in but as far as whether you can do that in compressor i'm, I'm not sure um but as far as Blu-ray and discs are, it would be a little dis disconcerting to me if the titles are just burned in. I mean, because look, D DVDs and Blu-ray should be interactive. I should be able to go to a menu on a disc and turn that off. And if I can't, that would bug me. It would bug me greatly. So that's something that if you're going to do it, I, I, I feel like it should be, if you find an authoring software, it needs to be user directed and not burned in. But that's Again, it's it's me being cheeky. I don't I don't want to be I don't want to burn in titles that are always up there. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments about that, Mark. Uh, no, I just want, thought I could show people where they can uh, do this in Final Cut. Yeah, um, yeah show them. I think that would yeah, be Ken, useful. Ken, or yeah, not. yeah, Ken would probably want to see that. All right. Do I need? Let me see. I'm still screen sharing yeah. at this point. Yeah. Okay. So you can see I've got a project here. And this project has uh, captions on it, so um, I created those by importing them after having the the project uh, transcribed by one of the services we talk about. So you can see the captions in the index are enabled here. I could turn them on and off. So if I go to share this project, I'm just go up to the share menu and say, let's say I'm just going to go and do a master file. I'm not going to upload it anywhere. And let's say I'll do audio and video H.264. And um, by default, those captions uh, aren't going to show up. So people get a little confused about this because they 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 get a transcript made using the built-in, you know, one of the extensions built in, or using a service, um, Speedscriber, or um, one of the other transcription services, and they bring those in, and then they export their video. Like well, captions, well, captions are closed captions, like Steve said, by default. They're not on unless. A, a user turns them on, but if you want to burn them in, in this dialog box here where it says captions, 
So just to be clear, I'm on the roles tab here. If you click on captions, there you can enter, you can choose to burn in captions that if you've got them on there. So I choose that, burn in captions, say okay. And now those captions will be burned in. You can see it says burned in captions. So now if I go ahead and export that, all of those will show up in the video and you can't turn them off at that point. Which these days often you want that for social media purposes, like you're saying, because you could it'll show up in the feed, uh, you know, in somebody's social media feed, and you can read the text without hearing it. Okay, so um, Rakesh Shadow Dedeven, um, compressor keeps failing with code fifty minus fifty. I have no idea what code minus fifty is, but what I've discovered is that. If compressor doesn't like something about the codec, if there's something that it's unhappy with, what I would do is, um, one way you can test this is take the same clip, uh, transcode it to another codec, maybe ProRes, then bring it back in and see if it does, gives you the same error. I found that in most cases, compressor doesn't like the data in the movie container. And so that's what I would try. But, uh, hey, Ron, uh, Ron Emser saying, not sure if Final Cut is my best option. I edited years ago with Premiere and loved it. I was convinced to move to a MacBook Pro and struggling with this. So Ron, if you're struggling, that's what we're here for. That's what we do. Um, you know, we've, we have tons of tutorials. I'd recommend Steve's core training. That'll take you through exactly how to, the thing about Final Cut Pro 10, if you're coming from any other NLE, and everybody who's on this listening will, will attest to this, is that it works differently and at first it's a little bit confusing and you have a little bit of hand holding to get you over the hump. And I'm talking like a day and then you'll never go back. You'll wonder how you ever worked any other way. I'm telling you, once you grok the, 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 the metadata and the, the, the timeline, you will never go back and Steve will walk you through that. So get his core training. It will save you so much time and frustration and it'll just, he'll walk you right through and then you'll be in the promised land. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be you'll be happy you'll be happy and steve will steve will take you there <laughs> it's true uh, uh, it's funny mark it's, yeah, all right yeah, how final we doing cut, final, final, final cut moses yeah exactly um we're doing good we're actually coming to the top of the hour so we, we're we've been yeah. going at this for almost two hours buddy yeah um all right, well, just there's somebody, uh, Nova Web Design, what's the best way to slow a clip 60% to play it smoothly? Well, retime it in Final Cut. Just use the retiming control. Um, you can just drag, once you hit Command R and drag the end of it, um, and then you can change the quality of the speed from the pop-up menu. Uh, I guess we should show that instead of just talking about it. Um, show, not tell, show, not tell. Yeah, show not tell. I'm just trying to bring up a better uh, project to show. One second. Okay, great. I've got. A, am I sharing my screen? Okay. So I want to slow. Here I've got a clip. Our friend Abba driving up. This is from our color correction tutorial that shows you how you can change the color of his car and nothing else. But I noted this pop-up menu here, the retiming menu. Uh, you can click here if the clip is selected, um, and choose some different built-in speeds. Um, but what I like to do is just hit Command R, and then you can use this bar, grab the right side of it, and you can speed it up to whatever speed, or you want to slow it down. So let's go down to 60%. Um, so that's step one. Let's say you want exactly 60% right there. 60%, okay? So that's part one. Part two is under the same pop-up menu as video quality, normal frame blending or optical flow. If you want the best quality, much of the time you can choose optical flow and it will create new in-between frames if you need it. I would just play it and see how it looks first. Depends on the, on the uh, clip. This looks a little bit jerky because we're just um, repeating frames in order to get there. So let's go ahead and choose optical flow and Final Cut will analyze the clip and create new in-between frames. Sometimes this works better, sometimes it doesn't. It totally depends on the material. Once it's done, you want to render, Control-R will render that clip. 
and I'll let it render to see if it's any better. But that's basically the process. So let's play it now. There, now we have a, you know, it's much smoother. It's a nice smooth 60% there. Um, and Steve's tutorials go into more detail on this because you can hit Shift S to do a blade speed. Um, sorry, Shift B to blade speed. And now I could speed this other part up or slow it down. I'll do another one. You can put a couple different uh, speed ramps in here and, and ramp so we have different speeds. Super really useful um, tools for doing speed changes in Final Cut. So there's a question, Mark, from JP Molin about any tips or tricks on how to search the timeline for a particular effect, generator, title, where it came from, similar to using Shift F to search where a clip from timeline came from. Uh, looking for Yeah, so that can be, that's a great question. So, it, so in the index, you can search on clip names. Um, so I'm in the index here and I'm on clips. You can also search on tags if you've tagged clips and it'll find anything and jump to it. So if like I go to clips and I hit check, it finds all my clips that have the word check in them. Um, so you can search by clip name. When it comes to titles, especially third party titles, that's tougher, but I'm gonna recommend a product to you, which is called XX, <laughs> XFX Handler. <clears throat> and I'll post a link to it, um, because it can analyze the XML of your project and tell you uh, what, that, what the source of that clip is, like what third-party project it came from, if that third party put that information in the XML. So I'm just gonna paste it in our chat window here, XFX Handler. Um, it's a free product, free product, and it will help you with titles, because that's, I just had that problem yesterday, honestly. I opened up a project I needed to re-edit, and I had a some titles from our uh, RT, um, one of our RT Align uh, titles that I had made a while ago, and I couldn't tell where it came from, and I needed to kind of track it down. So it's going to be a little harder. So XFX Handler is totally helpful. So Brian uh, Sigmiller, I, I did get your question. I, I'm still, the question, thank you by the way for the super chat. Can I send a storyline to Compressor in order to make a multi-track video? The reason I didn't answer that because I'm not sure what you mean by a multi-track video. You, um, uh, you know, you, you, you send one, you know, you send your content from Final Cut, it makes one burned in movie. So uh, maybe you can give me a little bit of more of like, what do you mean? Right? Do you want do you want to have two separate video well, streams, or do you, do you what do you think, Mark? Well, I'm just thinking like when you in Final Cut when you export, you can export roles as individual yes, tracks. Yes. Yeah. You know they can be separate tracks, um, and you can do this. I'm I'm assuming you do the same thing in Compressor. I don't really use Compressor very much, but I'm I'm sure you could do the same thing in Compressor where you can export your roles as uh, as separate tracks or as a multi-track as a single multi-track Final Cut movie where each track like music sound effects, dialogue are each embedded in that same multi can in that same video, sorry, in that same video file as separate tracks in the same file. Yeah, I think, he, thank you, by the way, he just, he clarified with one word, stem. <laughs> so I think he's, he's saying yeah. I, I want, I want these come out as stems, right? So. Yeah. Uh, so you, you assign those to roles. So you know, yeah, you just go right. ahead and, uh, you know, if you share my screen. Um, so uh, here I am, I've got uh, primary storyline and I've got a secondary well these are connected clips but I could make I literally could make a another storyline is what's what he's saying here right and then I can go in and choose assign video roles edit roles I'm gonna go ahead and make another video role and call this uh, secondary it's just so I don't know not I'm not too creative about this right now secondary and so I have my video role my secondary role I click apply and now I'm going to go down here and choose assign video roles secondary. Now it turns orange. So I have no, I say two separate roles. They can come out as, they can come out as stems on the other end. Uh, so when I go to file and I go to uh, share, uh, I got to choose master file. And when the window comes up, I go over to roles and uh, under roles, you can then choose like you, you right now it says video track right now. It's going to, you could say quick time movie, but Notice this, video only is separate files. These are your stems. So you, video only is separate files. And then you can go here and say like, I want all my secondaries as one. In fact, I don't need my, well, right now it's set up. 
all right now it's set up that my titles will be a separate stem my video on my primary will be a separate stem and all my secondaries will be a separate stem so when i export these out each one of these will be a stem so that's or, yes go ahead in that same pop-up menu that you just selected separate there's a option for multi-track multi-track quicktime movie yeah but I, and that would take I don't, I don't, but if you select that and then each each of those would be embedded in the same movie. And I, I know you're using video, but each of those could be audio roles. Each of those could be separate right. stems. And he, but if he wants them separate, I get, I agree. He wouldn't want See, it that I, way. Yeah, but. it's funny you would say this. I, I when I hear multi-track, I think audio. So in fact, somebody asked a question, and I, I was going to yeah. get to it. How do I take like tw ten audio connected audio tracks and export it out as a QuickTime movie that has all of those tracks embedded? Well, this is the answer right here. Uh, so if you have you know, 10 connected audio tracks to your secondary, to your primary storyline, you could come in here, choose this, and then when you send, send it out, that QuickTime movie will have 10 embedded individual stereo tracks or mono tracks or whatever inside that movie. And then you should be able to bring, bring, bring back that movie into Final Cut and it, metadata-wise, you should see in the inspector, the audio configuration, you'd still see all of that track data. But uh, back to this, I would just say this is what this is what he is implying is that I want to get out separate stem. This is the way I would do it. Uh, I wouldn't bother with yeah. compressor. So, and it, well, well he and says my guess it, is you could still do the same thing in compressor. Um. Uh, let's find out. I don't. I, just, I've never done it because it's just so easy to do it from Final Cut. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. let's see. Your date night one would be a well, great example because it's got no, all those I'm, roles I'm already use, assigned. I'm gonna use this one because I already got the video. I mean, cause he said video specifically. He didn't say audio. So. Oh, he wants video. Yeah, he okay. wants video. That's, 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 okay. what I, that's, that's what weird. I read it. So. Video stems? I don't understand. I, that's what I don't understand either. But um, bottom line is you need to find the project, Trimming B, and now we're gonna send this to Compressor. And I don't know if it's going to recognize. We'll see here. Um, let's chat, let's just go ahead and choose um, one of the ProRes presets. I'll just choose ProRes. I'll just choose ProRes uh, 422. Okay. Throw that on there. So I have a preset. Now I'm going to video. Now, now, now if it did it at all, it would be an option. You know, in here. There, Somewhere there. There would right? be in here. And I've never. I've never seen. Never seen I've it. never seen the ability to uh, bring out stems uh, from uh, the compressor menu. In fact, this is where it would be. I mean, there, you have, of course, you have general. Yeah. Um, let's see, format, no audio, no it's nope. So, mm. I no, I don't think it's possible. But I, you know, somebody should correct me out there. But I don't think you can do it. I think you got to do it. Okay. In, in, do it out of final yeah, cut. do it out of Final Cut. So. So Peter Hitchcock like got back with some clarification on his. Uh, I want to get back to him because you know, see if you can answer. It says using. I see. I yeah, see. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, reading yeah. it. Yeah. So so what it, Peter is using Rec 2020 HLG on a Rec 79 timeline in Final Cut. <sighs> yeah, Peter. So a couple. Th the, what I would say is this: it all depends on what your target delivery is. Are you trying to deliver HDR material to be view be viewed in HDR? Or are you just using HLG, 2020 HLG to get more dynamic range, um, which I wouldn't do. If, you're, if your target delivery is like the web, it's Rec. 709, there's no advantage to working in HDR. And um, anything that's HDR, you know, either um, PQ or HLG, is not gonna look right in Final Cut. It absolutely won't look right, even if you are correctly in a in a Rec 2020 or an HDR library and also in a HDR project because your computer monitor can't display that range of brightness values, which is why you need a, an HDR, mon HDR capable monitor, which are very pricey. The, the, I think the best option right now is the Pro Display XDR. It's you know, $5,000 instead of $25,000. Uh, so you, but you really need a calibrated HDR monitor if you're going to be color correcting in HDR, if you're going to be delivering free HDR. Um, Apple has a good white paper on the whole process of, of delivering an HDR and then how you also deliver an SDR. And also in our advanced color correction tutorial, we have a lesson 
that goes into the exact process for creating your HDR master and your SDR submaster. Um, so it's, I think it's more we can answer right here. It's a, it's a fairly deep subject, but you need to have your Final Cut library set up correctly, the Final Cut project in that library set up correctly. Those clips that you've brought in need to be interpreted correctly, and then you need to know, you know where you're going out to. Um, and then whether it makes sense to be working at a thousand nit max, at a higher than that, at a lower than that, it's it's a it's a big subject. But hopefully that gives you some some pointers. So Jagat, um, you asked about Final Cut Future. We mentioned that we don't comment on products that may or may not exist at Apple. So there's our standard answer. <laughs> All, right. All right. So I think I should make two hours, man. Yeah. I'm getting hungry. Yeah, I think I gotta <laughs> get, get hungry too. <laughs> well, this I, has been great. Thanks, you guys, for posting so many questions. This has been really, really fun to do. Yeah. So hopefully, we are a, a, um, answered all of them that you had. And by the way, if we didn't get to all of them, I mean, we're going to do this again, and we'll just go back. We'll go back to the list, and we'll pull out them, and we'll answer those. And one of the nice things is we we do like to send out surveys to so that we kind of have an idea of what are the kinds of things you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, so, Qual, you said no answer to my transcoding question. Go ahead and post it there one more time. That'll be the last question we get to. All right. So, post it there. And um, so, a couple of other things. I don't go to, let me go to the browser really quick here. Um, just, uh, just a uh, reminder that uh, we have, um, let's see here, Travis's tutorial on OBS that you want to pick up and he's going to, and uh, this is 39 bucks if you want to know how we do our streaming setup. <laughs> and Mark, uh, Mark's Art of the Cutting the Interview. And then um, there was one more, a compressor we talked about. And then we also talked about, uh, we have a couple of really, really great uh, tutorials for $10 right now. You can, you can get, um, you can get um, pick up, which is Mark's Media Management. He talked a lot about media management at the top of the hour, at the top of the at 11 o'clock hour, uh, you know, 59 bucks on sale for 10 bucks, you can get media management. And then uh, he's got another, and we have another one on um, motion, which is, uh, I don't know why I don't have the tab up here if I go into motion here. <laughs> the other one is if you want to get into motion, uh, he also has this one for 10, we have this one called Warp Speed Motion for 10 bucks. And this is an amazing tutorial if you want to know what motion can do for you as a Final Cut Pro. 10 editor. All right. Uh, let's see if um, the last question was posted. I yeah, so there's been, uh, qu there's been questions about when's our next show, and we don't yeah. quite know yet. Yeah. We're going to sort of regroup and see yeah. what makes sense. Obviously, we're living in a, in a fluid situation right now, but we'll probably do it again soon. You know, this this was great. We had really great attendance, and, and it was a lot of fun to do, and a lot of folks are home right now, so we'll probably uh, do this again soon. We just, we've got, you know, we've got work we need to do, too. <laughs> As well, got to get some products done and out there. I've got some exciting stuff in the queue to show you guys. Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, I think Alex said uh, same time tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Let's just all hang out here yeah. and ignore what's going on in the rest of the world, yeah. where it just feels a little more comfortable. <clears throat> well, again, I want to thank you all um, for support. I, if I didn't say this, it bears repeating. Thank you so much for supporting. Our channel, if you bought a tutorial plugin, we, we don't take you for granted. We really appreciate you guys. Um, thank you, Laura. Thank you for all the, the stuff that you do. And uh, thank you for joining us. And we know your time's val valuable. I'm having a hard time getting words out all of a sudden. <laughs> your time is valuable. So thank you. Uh, thank you again. So everybody, wash your hands and uh, keep your distance. And we'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks.